Let's hear a second message from our speaker uh, entitled The Duty of Parenting. Preacher Sam. Thank you. If you'll turn with me now to Ephesians chapter 6. Let me read a few verses here from Ephesians chapter 6. This will be our special focus for this second message. Hebrews chapter 6, let me read from verse 1 to verse 4. Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. We are considering especially the duty of parenting. We covered some of this already in the previous message. We saw the basic perspective that we need as parents, some of the basic principles that guide our parenting. And now we want to focus especially on some aspects of our duty as parents. And of course, this is on some level at least universally recognized. We all know that there is a responsibility to being a parent. We all know that parenthood comes with this duty and responsibility. You can't just leave your children, you can't neglect them, you have to care for them. But I think instinctively we tend to view this parental responsibility in worldly terms. Again, as mentioned last time, as though our responsibility is just to help our children to be successful in the world, prosperous, materially, well-educated and so on, as though the responsibility of, of a parent is tied up in these worldly goals. As we mentioned earlier, our priority should be different, coming out of our recognition of God's purpose and God's promises. There's nothing wrong with these worldly goals in themselves, nothing wrong with being prosperous, nothing wrong with being well-educated, but they can distract and detract from our spiritual priority. Because often these goals and these priorities are in conflict with one another. There's a contradiction. And children can very easily pick up on our emphasis and adopt it. If we emphasize the material or the physical over the spiritual, and that is very easily picked up by our children. And they learn that they should prioritize physical things or material things over spiritual things. I think one fairly common example is, again, in the time of exams, when there's great pressure and stress, we want our children to study hard, we want them to do well. And so there's a tendency for us to tell our children, focus on your studies. Don't go for fellowship meeting this week because you have to study, you have to finish your assignments, you have to finish your preparation for the exams. Study first. Then if, you're, if you've done your work, if, you're, if you've finished all that, if, if, if you're done with everything, and if you have time, then you can go for the, for the fellowship group meeting or, or perhaps even for, for church. I think this is sadly quite, quite common among parents, even Christian parents. But we have to realize that in a case like that, without even saying anything directly to our children, we have already communicated a certain relative priority. We've already taught them, not in words, but by our own example, by our instruction, we have taught them that this is more important than that, that spiritual things, the Word of God, fellowship with God's people, the worship of God, can be put at second place, that our studies come first. Without telling them in so many words, we have communicated that to them. And there are consequences to such an instruction, consequences to communicating this kind of relative priority. Again, it's not that studying is unimportant. Of course, we do want our children to study. We want them to be diligent. We want them to finish their homework and their preparation. We want them to do well for the Lord. 
And so we need wisdom as parents to manage these priorities rightly and to communicate that effectively to our children. And I say all this really just to emphasize that the duty of parenting is something to take very seriously. It's something that requires a great deal of wisdom and prayer because how we raise our children will have a great impact on their, on their future. It matters a great deal how we teach them. We saw already in Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. The, things, the foundation that we lay as parents will have a great impact on our children's future. And this has an even greater significance when we bring in that broader perspective in light of God's great overall plan and purpose. How we raise our children matters for them and that in turn matters for others. Our parenting will have a great impact on our children and when our children are, are older, they will have a great impact on the world because they're human beings made in the image of God. They can do a great deal for good or for evil. And so really there is a great responsibility to parenting. It affects everything. It affects the whole world. It's the significance of, of each human life. But God has not left us without guidance or without instruction. We are taught in the Word of God how to be good parents, and what it means to, to faithfully fulfill the duty of a parent. And we see that here in Ephesians chapter 6, especially in verse 4. We'll try and build some basic thoughts on this verse. And ye fathers, the apostle says, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Early on, he has spoken of the responsibility of children. They have their responsibility. They must fulfill it. Honor thy father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. There's a great promise attached to this of long life and prosperity. When you honor your parents, when you follow that good path that they teach you. But the parents also have this responsibility and it is expressed here. The parents must teach their children well and train them and instruct them. Parents must lead them to walk with the Lord. And this involves, in the first place, discipline. This verse is addressed to fathers particularly because they are the heads of the home. The father is the head of, of his wife, the mother, and he is the head of the household. This is God's design for the family. The primary responsibility for the order of the whole household rests on the shoulders of the man, the father. And so also in discipline, he is primarily responsible. It's not that the mother cannot discipline. Of course she can. In many cases she does. But even in disciplining her children, she is under the headship and authority of her husband. She's not separate from him or apart from him. She is disciplining, exercising her authority as a mother, but she is still under the headship of her husband. That's why fathers, I believe, are addressed especially in this verse. But it applies to mothers as well. Remember, there is that authority with or attached to the parents. Both the father and the mother have authority over the children. So it is honor thy father and mother. So the mothers are included here implicitly, even though it is the fathers especially that are addressed. And the point here that is made, first of all, is that in this exercise of parental authority, parents must be cautious. There is a warning here. Provoke not your children to wrath. In the exercise of parental authority, we must be careful not to go too far. We must be careful to exercise that authority responsibly, not irresponsibly. There are many ways in which fathers and mothers can provoke their children to wrath. Parents can, can be unfair, for example. We can forbid something and then do it ourselves. I think we, we all recognize this. I tell my child, don't keep looking at your phone. But that's what I do. And then the child sees me as the father, always looking at my phone. And what is the thought? Straight away, why do you tell me not to do it and you are doing it? It's not fair. I tell my I tell my children, when you come home, 
Don't just throw your shoes around. Put them back in the cupboard. Be neat. And then when I come home, what do I do? I just throw my shoes off and walk in. And my children see that. And then they ask themselves, how come I have to be neat and my father doesn't have to be neat? It's not fair. And that provokes them to wrath, doesn't it? It makes them angry. There's this sense of unfairness. Parents can favour one child over another. That can be a great pr provocation. Children are very sensitive to unfairness because, because that's human nature. Anytime someone gets something that I don't get, we're very sensitive to that because that's our sinful nature. We're always on the lookout for reasons to compare and complain. And children are like that. As soon as one child gets something and the other doesn't, oh, it's unfair. You love, you love my sibling more than me. And that can provoke them to wrath. Of course, many times they are wrong to think that it's unfair. But how we handle that also is part of the duty of parenting, to be very sensitive and cautious. We don't want to provoke them to wrath unnecessarily. Parents can be rude to their children. When we're tired, when we're stressed, we can be rude to our children. Parents can be cruel to our children. We can neglect our children. We can treat them harshly. And even in punishing our children when they are really wrong and deserve punishment, we can go too far. We can be overly harsh in our punishment. We can give vent to our anger in punishing our children. It's possible and sadly common because we are sinful for parents to sin, even in disciplining their children, to go too far, even where the child needs to be punished. That punishment can become a venting of the parents' frustration rather than really disciplining them in the Lord. When we go too far in this way, when we exercise our authority in these wrong ways, then instead of accomplishing the purpose of correcting our children, this kind of discipline will only provoke them to wrath and cause them to sin more. It will drive the sin, as it were, deeper into their hearts because they are filled with this sense of unfairness and cruelty and injustice. And we don't want that for our children. So there is a caution, there is a warning here in how we exercise our, response, our, our authority and responsibility as parents. But this caution and this warning, of course, is not meant to give us the impression that discipline and punishment is bad and we should never do it. Of course, that's not the case. Such punitive correction is most necessary. Remember, we learned earlier, our children are sinners. By nature, there is this innate corruption. When they are left to themselves, they won't do what is good, they will do what is bad. And so punishment and discipline is necessary in order to teach our children the difference between right and wrong. Teach them the consequences of sin. To teach them that sin is something that brings displeasure to God. It is contrary to His will. We have to train our children in that, and that involves discipline, punishment. It involves the rod. And so as much as parents are warned and cautioned here not to abuse that authority, we are also taught in Scripture not to neglect our exercise of that authority, not to neglect discipline. For example, if we turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, we have this very sad instance here. First <clears throat> Samuel chapter 3 and verse 13. This is God's message to Eli through young Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, For I have told him, God says, told Eli, that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, <coughs> and he restrained them not. He neglected this duty of discipline. He did not restrain his sons in their sinfulness. And it got worse and worse. <clears throat> and we see there an example of the consequences of this. It's not just Eli's sons who were affected. The whole nation was affected. The worship of God was affected. The people abhorred the worship and the sacrifices of the temple because of the sin of Eli's sons. 
And that sin can be traced back to his failure. God rebukes him for it and punishes him for it. Eli and his house suffered because of this failure to exercise parental authority, to discipline and to restrain the, ch- the sin of our children. That's part of our duty as parents. Our children are sinners and we must restrain that sin by punishment. <clears throat> And we should remember as parents that we have for our model God himself as our Heavenly Father. We see how he deals with us as his children. He does not neglect discipline. He chastises us, sometimes severely. And yet we know that it is always for our good. It is never overly harsh. It's always tempered with mercy and grace. It is always out of a loving purpose. That's how God deals with us. With his children. And that's part of our responsibility as parents also to model this love of God and this godly discipline for our children so that they see what it means to have a to have a heavenly father. They see a reflection of that in their own parents who are believers. We should never deal with our children in such a way as to obscure the fatherly love and the fatherly discipline of God. We should never deal with our children in such a way as to contradict that, but rather to exemplify that. I heard a story once of <clears throat> of um, someone, I think it was a young man, relating a great difficulty that he had in becoming a Christian because he could not accept the idea of God as father because of his own bad experience with his father. The thought of God as a father just made him very uncomfortable because to him, a father is just a big bully, someone who is very harsh, someone who is very cruel, someone who is stronger than me, who oppresses me. That was his concept of a father because that was his experience. And so when he, what, what we read as something very wonderful, what we read as something very desirable that God deals with us as a father deals with his children to this man was something he didn't want because of that bad experience and of course we don't want our children to think that way we want to show them what it means to to have this parental love and this parental discipline so we are cautioned here against going too far in our discipline of our children We must never forget that in disciplining them, we are discharging a duty before God. We are accountable to Him. We are bringing them up in the Lord. This is not just an exercise in inventing our own frustrations. We don't discipline them just out of our own convenience, just to get things our way. We don't discipline them just to, to satisfy our stresses and pressures. I want my children to be quiet, Otherwise, other people will think badly of me. And so I'm very harsh with them. I discipline them. You better be quiet in the worship service. Otherwise, so and so will complain. And then I will look bad. But that's not why we discipline them. It's not to make ourselves look good. It's not for our own convenience. Not so everyone thinks well of us. That's the wrong focus. We discipline them to teach them the way of the Lord. What is right and wrong in God's eyes. We are exercising and discharging a duty and a responsibility before God. And we are accountable to Him for the way that we discipline our children. As parents, surely we desire the good of our children. And no good comes out of provoking them to wrath with our discipline. And that requires really a great deal of sensitivity and thoughtfulness, as we mentioned mentioned already. We must be aware of the character and the temperament of our own children. It's not always appropriate to punish in particular ways. It's not always appropriate to give the rod. Sometimes it is and we should, but it's not always appropriate. You have to be very very careful not to punish in a way that is too severe for that particular child in his or her particular situation, based on his or her particular temperament and character. We have to understand this as children because we want to show them that everything we do is out of a genuine love for them and care for them. 
we're not just doing it thoughtlessly, we're not doing it because everyone else is doing it. We really care for them and know them and want the best for them. And everything that we do that we do is geared towards them, out of love for them, to promote their good, truly. And that requires a great patience. It's a slow process. Sin will not be restrained overnight. It's not so easy to deal with. And so our tendency to, to judge and criticize can actually be very destructive and damaging. Because this is our tendency, isn't it? And I think we're all like this to some degree. When I see a child misbehaving, the immediate assumption is, oh, the parents aren't, aren't doing enough. Oh, these parents don't discipline their children properly. Otherwise, why would they misbehave? I forget that children misbehave. That's what they do. But that's the instinct. That's the tendency. And then there's this comparison, right? My children are better behaved than your children. I discipline them better than you. There's this instinctive judge, judgmentalism, criticism. And of course, sometimes it's true that the parents are not disciplining their children properly. And as parents, we should examine ourselves. When we hear such criticism, I should ask myself, is it true? Am I really failing? Should I be doing more to discipline my children? But then as outside observers, we have to be careful also not to be too presumptuous, not to jump to conclusions. How do we know that the parents are not disciplining their children? Maybe this particular child is going through a difficult period or has a difficult character. Maybe this particular child needs special attention and care. Every child is a work in progress. This is a long process. We should be careful not to judge hastily based on one snapshot that we observe. You see one instance of a misbehaving child and we build up a whole history of parental neglect. And that's not warranted. So we should rather pray for these families and encourage them, even as we seek to examine ourselves. It's not easy to discipline children and to restrain sin. It takes time and patience, it takes prayer, it takes a great deal of sensitivity and understanding. Each child is an individual. We must deal with each child as an individual. No one else knows our children like we do as parents, apart from God, of course. But really, all this discipline and punishment comes under the umbrella of nurture. And that's the next part of the verse. Provoke not your children to wrath. Don't go too far in discipline. But discipline them rightly. And everything that you do is all with this view. To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the main focus. The nurture. To bring them up in the Lord. Discipline and punishment such as it is, is meant to serve that purpose. The word nurture here refers to training and instruction, including discipline. Admonition also, warning them against what is, what is wrong. Admonishing them to do what is good. To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is to train them in what is good and right in God's eyes. To warn them against what is evil and wrong in God's eyes. The aim is to teach them to avoid what is bad and to do what is good and to promote in them what is good, the right way, to guide them so that they walk in this way and persevere in this way. And this is the responsibility of parents. Just as parents are responsible for the physical nourishment of our children, so also, and perhaps even more, more importantly, we are responsible for the spiritual nourishment of our children. And that's why we correct and discipline our children, sometimes sternly when it is necessary but always lovingly. And again, we have God's example in this. In Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth, dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? This is chastening out of love. <clears throat> and I think that's, that's the especial emphasis here in Ephesians chapter, chapter 6 and verse 4. Don't go too far. Don't provoke them to wrath by being unfair or overly harsh in discipline. 
But don't be overindulgent either. Don't go too far, but don't do too little. Both are bad. Really, this nurture and the discipline go together. And then our children learn to be obedient, both out of fear as well as out of love. And that will see them through, even when we are not, no longer around. That fear and that love really have to go together. Think, we can think of it as a discipline to instill in them fear, a godly fear of what is bad, what is evil, what is wrong, what is sinful. We can think of this nurture as to instill in them a love, a love for what is good and right, a love for what their parents have taught them, a love for their parents, and a love most of all for God. And that fear and that love go together. You can't have one without the other. Love without fear is just the kind of sentimental affection that will disappear very quickly. Fear without love doesn't lead to genuine obedience. It's always accompanied with reluctance. If I fear but I don't love, then I only do it out of compulsion. And the moment there is, the moment my parents are gone, Obedience will be gone also. But fear and love together, discipline and nurture together, that will stay with our children all the way. They will not depart from it, but they will continue in this path when they are old because they have learned both fear and love. And that's not easy to do as parents. It's not an easy task to fulfill. We have to remember that all of this is done in the Lord. It is done in submission to Him. It is done in reliance on Him. It's done in submission to Him because otherwise it's very easy to give up. If we are not submissive to His will, if we don't see our duty as parents as something for which we are accountable to God, it's very easy to give up. But when we do it out of submission to the Lord, I'm doing this in the Lord, for the Lord, in obedience to Him, and that motivates us to keep going even when even when times are difficult. It gives us that higher motive to persevere. It keeps us accountable to the Lord. It must be done in reliance on the Lord because, of course, we need His help. We need His guidance by His Word and His Spirit. We must seek His will and His provision. So again, the duty of parenting goes together with the, with the promise of parenting. We take up the duty in light of the promise. We pursue the duty, resting in the promise. We both go together. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It is done in the Lord, with His help, with His guidance. And I want to begin to close this um, second message and this uh, first part of the seminar just by emphasizing that what we have described so far is, is the parent's duty before the Lord. And there's really no substitute. It is, a, it is a unique duty for parents. It's not even the church's duty primarily. The church cannot substitute for the parents. Even a good and sound and faithful church cannot be a substitute parent. Even the Sunday school teachers who are well-trained and faithful and diligent, cannot substitute for parents. They complement, they serve, they help, but ultimately our children need Christian homes. And there's no substitute for that. They need to see the love of God displayed. They need to see the law of God obeyed. They need to be taught, they need to be admonished. Now, of course, there are cases where the children are Christians and the parents are not. The Lord knows and He's gracious. He works. He provides in such instances. The psalmist says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. He's the God of the widow, widows. He's the father of the fatherless. God knows how to care for His children in such situations. In such situations, the church can step in. And the church can do a great deal, as much as it can. But if we are Christians, parents... If we neglect this unique duty that we have, then we miss out on a great privilege and a great blessing for ourselves and our children. There is something very special about the role of a parent. 
The role of a father, no one else can substitute. And the role of a mother, no one else can substitute. We see this in the Old Testament. We look back at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, when the Passover is instituted, God had in view the children, and he, and he had in view the role of the parents in communicating and teaching the meaning of this sacrament to their children. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 26, It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, Not, you're too young to understand. Not, it doesn't concern you. Not, go away and stop bothering me. That ye shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. They were supposed to teach their children. The parents were supposed to teach their children. Also Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 9. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all, all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, and the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. They are to teach their children the fear of the Lord. The parents have this role and this responsibility. Verse 40 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it, go, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. And with thy children. That was always the concern. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, that there was such an heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. The special duty of parents, the special position of parents, always there with the children. When they lie down, you are there. When they rise up, you are there, because you are their parents. When they walk by the way, you are there, because you are their parents. These are opportunities. And this is a duty in all these circumstances to teach them. Teach them the word of the Lord. Teach them his way. This is, of course, specially applicable to Israel as a covenant nation. But we have covenant homes, don't we? That's our understanding. We covered that in the, in the earlier message. And it's our duty and our privilege as Christian parents to lead our households, our children, in worshipping the Lord, in serving Him. And we have this special duty that we cannot afford to neglect. We must be worshipping the Lord as a family. Of course, it's very difficult. We understand that, especially with young children. And then with older children also, they are very busy sometimes busier than we are. But every day, a few minutes here, a few minutes there, speak to them of the Lord, pray with them, teach them the Word of God. That's an important part of our duty. Think again of the Proverbs. So much of the book of Proverbs is presented as parental instruction, isn't it? The father concerned for his son. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as those that go down into the pit. 
We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. This is a father concerned for his son. My son, he says. You see how he is applying the word of God to teach his children. This is not some abstract theory. He is giving them practical instruction, wisdom for their own lives. He knows what sinners will say. If they say, come with us, he knows how they will present it. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Let us all have one purse. He knows the ways of the world. He knows how sinners will seek to entice his children. He warns them against that. He tells them the end of that path. He tells them that it is evil. He tells them that everyone that is greedy of gain will end with his own life taken away. He warns them against the reality of sin and the consequences of sin. He knows what dangers his son will face and he's able to prepare his son to face those dangers. That's how we bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We have been in the world. We know the world. We know the dangers. We must apply the word of God. Apply it to show our children this is wrong. This will not end well. This will lead to your destruction. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. There shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honour the Lord with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new, ma new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Just imagine a father who is overly harsh in punishing his children. How is he going to say that last verse? That's the importance of taking up our duty responsibly and rightly because we want to teach our children the ways of the Lord. You see how, how concerned this father is for the good of his son. My son, my son, my son. He wants his son to have favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. And he's teaching his son how to do that. He wants his son to know the way to go. And he's teaching his son to do that. He wants his son to be prosperous. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. And thy presses shall burst out with new wine not out of greed and covetousness, but as the result of a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Walk in God's way. Don't despise His correction. Everything that was said earlier about not emphasizing worldly prosperity, not teaching our children to emphasize or prioritize worldly things over spiritual things, that doesn't mean we want our children to have a lousy life. It doesn't mean we want our children to be destitute and poor doesn't mean we want them to be scrounging for food. We want our children to have the best possible life. And that's why we teach them to emphasize spiritual things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's, that's what the father is teaching his son here. He wants his son to do well. And that's why he is teaching him. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of thy substance then you will have true and genuine prosperity. 
the best life is a life of godly priorities. That's what we want for our children. And then Proverbs chapter 5. My son, attend unto my wisdom. Bow thine ear to my, to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, and thou canst not know them. And so on. This is a repeated emphasis in Proverbs. Not only because it's a genuine danger for all young people, but I think Solomon is speaking here especially out of his own experience. This was his downfall. Strange women. He was taken in by them. His, his heart was led astray by them. He forsook the Lord. He built idols. He caused the whole land to sin. Some of these idols were not taken away until much later. I think that's, a, that's an example for us as parents. We have failed. We have sinned. We have made mistakes. We learn from them. We repent. And we teach our children. Don't repeat my mistakes. I went this way. It wasn't good. It was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Don't do that. Don't follow my, my mistake. Don't end up like I ended, like I ended up. There's that concern here. We should reflect on our errors and use what we have learned to teach our children. That's also part of bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We are able to do that because, first of all, we ourselves know the Word of God and apply it to our own lives. That's how we, l we know how to teach our children. It doesn't come out of nowhere. We have to do it first and have it first before we can teach them. And that's our great duty and responsibility as parents. We must ourselves be obedient to the Lord, grounded in His Word, so that we can teach our children, so that we can apply, as we have applied to ourselves, also to them, to warn them, to guide them. Really, a great part of this parental duty is to exemplify godliness to our children to show them what it means to be a Christian. As Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. This was Paul's instruction to Tim Timothy, to be an example of the believers. He said a similar thing to Titus, in Titus chapter 2, verse 7, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, be condemned. This applies in homes. This applies to parents. We must exemplify genuine godliness to our children. This is where we, we slip and we fail, at home. It's relatively easy for us to put up a facade when we go out. When we are in church, we know how to behave. We know what to say, what not to say. But at home, we are as close to our true selves as, as we can get. And our children see that. They see what, what I'm really like more than, more than you see. They see. Only my wife sees more. They see, they see what we are really like. They see whether we really mean the things that we say. And they can detect hypocrisy very easily. And then instead of exemplifying godliness to them, we have turned them away from it. We have taught them that religion is just a sham. We have taught them that Christianity is just a pretense and just a fake thing. We don't want that. We want to exemplify genuine godliness 
to our children. And so we need to be students of God's Word because we have a sacred trust and duty to be teachers of God's Word to our children. We need to be in prayer because we have precious souls entrusted to our care and a duty to teach them to pray to the Lord. We must exemplify all the things that we are teaching our children in moral instruction. And because we are not perfect, we have to exemplify repentance for them also and show them what it means to acknowledge our mistakes and our faults, to apologize, to seek forgiveness. Now in all this, I don't, I don't mean to diminish those who, are, those who are not parents or not yet parents. There's always a role for us to play in the church. We're all family in the church of the household of God. And there's a role for all of us to help to, to teach those who are younger in the faith, less mature, less, less experienced. Here in Titus chapter 2, the aged men, the aged women are to be teachers, that they may teach Verse 4, the older women are to teach the young women. Young men also are to be taught and exhorted. So th Those who are older always have this duty and responsibility to teach. But there is something inescapably unique and vitally important in the role of a parent in the lives of our children. Fathers as fathers, mothers as mothers. And this is crucial for the growth and nurture of our children. So for those of us who are parents, we must take up our duty, take it seriously, prayerfully. And for us as children, we should be praying for our parents and for ourselves, that we can honor them and learn from them. There's a great encouragement in the promise of parenting. But all of that is to no avail if we will not take up the duty of parenting and do our part. So much of what God purposes to accomplish in the world, He purposes to accomplish through us, through His human instruments. And that's our privilege. So let us take up that duty and perform it responsibly, and rightly, and joyfully in the Lord. And let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, once again we thank you for your word and for your instruction. We pray you will speak to our hearts by your spirit to apply this word to us. We pray that we will not be hearers only of the word, but doers also as you work in us and help us. We pray that you would be especially with us as parents. We may take up the duty of parenting, understanding the great privilege and responsibility that we have, understanding your great plan and purpose in all that we are called to do as parents. We pray you will strengthen us and help us, uphold us where we are prone to fail, and help us. We pray for our children, for all the children here, that you will be with them. We pray for their salvation. Surely this is your purpose in giving them to us as we do our part to teach them the gospel. We pray you will be at work by your Spirit, powerfully to convert and to convict, to draw them to the Lord, that they may be part of your kingdom forever and ever. We pray that you would be merciful to use them for your glory. If the Lord tarries, that they may grow and be faithful servants and holy witnesses for the Lord Jesus, right until the end. We commit all this into your hands acknowledging all the difficulties, but trusting that you are able to help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.